We always start the show with a few samples, and Michael says he has something that potentially will escape, but we'll let him talk about it anyway. Okay, Kim, and hopefully everyone can see what we have here. What we have here is a leaf-footed pine seed bug. I don't know if we can quite get it, zero in, uh, yeah, zoom in it, on Michael. it. Very yeah. good. And the reason it's called leaf pine seed bug is if you look at the back leg here, it's expanded, kind of looks like a leaf. And as the name implies, it feeds on pine seeds, developing in pine cones. Uh, as far as being a pest, it's not a pest except if you're trying to grow pine seeds. Uh, in the fall, in the winter, we'll find these in houses, and they're kind of a curiosity because they're kind of a, kind of a real pretty looking insect. But um, it's not a nuisance, it's just really a curiosity more than anything else. Well, and we appreciate your bringing that one in because I don't think we've ever had that one on the show. Oh, well, good. So there good. you go. All right, Dennis, uh, you have an imaginary creature. Right. Since we're at the zoo, it wouldn't be proper to bring an animal because of the disease transmission. I want to bring up something that's been happening across the state in the last few weeks and months is that I've been called at the university for a number of animals such as pythons and boas that have gotten away or released by people found at cities parks so a, a six-foot red-tailed boa in Lincoln uh, a boa in Holdridge and a Russian tortoise in Omaha at a park we have to be more responsible because that's how invasive species uh, cause problems and cause a lot of damage so if you have a pet you have an animal make sure it's secure and never release a foreign pet or animal in the wild all right, thank you, Dennis. Lauren, you scavenged that, and you don't smell good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so a uh, lot of interest in nuisance fungi this time of year, and so uh, we see these in a lot of different mulch beds and in the lawn uh, when we have a lot of rain. And so just right here at the zoo, I, I just reached in a mulch bed here and found some stinkhorn mushrooms, and that's what we have. We're looking at, they're actually kidding me about smelling because they actually smell pretty bad. Uh, they're, they spread with flies actually being attracted to that dark mass on the top that we see in here. And, uh, and then that has spores in it now move the, actually the, the fungus around. Uh, but you'll see them like this when they're drying a little bit. Uh, when they're more fresh, they'll be more upright and you'll have that, you know, this kind of dark material will be sticking straight up like this. But in, in any event, these are, are basically just breaking down organic material. And you can see a real nice example of that. All these, all these fibrous, uh, what looks like roots almost, are, are just uh, actually the, uh, the fungus itself and the hyphae growing through all the wood mulch in there and, and just breaking down that organic material. So anytime we have nuisance fungi or mushrooms that we don't want in our landscape, really the main thing is to try to remove that food source if we can. Um, I don't encourage any, you know, trying to eat any of these. You want to, sometimes some of them can be poisonous, uh, so you can just simply remove them or mow over them if they're in a lawn or a setting. Uh, and then just, just keep in mind that there are mulches that favor them. So any of your softwood mulches are more favorable for nuisance fungi than your conifer-based mulches, for example. You know, even hardwood mulches are more favorable than conifer-based mulches. Uh, so your cypress or cedar mulches are better uh, to avoid problems with this. All right. Thank you, Lauren. Put it down. <laughs> I'm going to hand it to you, Kim. Okay. All right, Kelly, what did you bring today? Okay. What I have today are some cucumber flowers, actually. And uh, this, I got my first question about this time of the year. People will call and say, my cucumbers have a lot of uh, flowers on them, but they're not producing any fruit. The flowers are just dropping off. In most cases, that's because those first flowers are male flowers. Cucumbers are what we call monoecious plants, so the male and the female flower are on the same plant, uh, but they're separate flowers. So if you see here, I have, this is a male flower, and at the base of it, the male flower is the one with the pollen and the stamen, and at the base of it, uh, there doesn't look like a little tiny cucumber. Where this is a little bit older female flower, which obviously has um, uh, an, an ovary that's been fertilized and it's starting to enlarge into the little tiny cucumber. So you and we had to look this when I was looking for this to bring this as an example. We had to look very hard to find what, one of the females, and that's because cucumbers, the first flowers that set on, um, are um, almost always males first. And then we tell people just be a little bit patient and eventually the female flowers will come on and they'll start to be pollinated and you'll start to get cucumbers. So as long as you're not applying an insecticide, interfering with uh, pollination, insect pollination, um, pretty soon they should start to set as soon as those female flowers appear. 
All right, thank you, Kelly. Well, we hope that helps people who want cucumbers for pickling or whatever. So, Michael, you get the first uh, picture okay. of the night, and this is a viewer in Sioux City. They have a problem with roses. Some of them will open, some won't. They have kind of a nasty, rusty look. We had a little discussion about what it may or may not be. So, what are you, what are you going to tell these Sioux Cityans? Well. Since it's coming to me, probably everyone's thinking it might be <clears throat> thrips. Uh, but the picture we have up on the screen right now, you see it's kind of circulars with uh, circular spots there with white on the inside and pink on the outside. Um, if it's if it going to be thrips damage, and or at least typical thrips damage, we'd see more of a browning where the thrips have been feeding. Uh, so I don't know that everything we're seeing are all thrips, but it could be some disease in here as well. All right, and I'm glad you described the thrips because we did have botrytis and roses, I think, last week, did we not, Lauren? Yeah, and it, it could look some like that, right. so, so right. some of that could be botrytis. Okay, excellent. All right, Dennis, you get the next one. Okay. Uh, this is a viewer who sent in an image of a hole in the ground, no critter involved, but they want to know what could have created that hole and what exactly could they potentially do about it? Sure. There's not really a lot of scale there, but there's no dirt around the hole, and it's fairly smooth. And by the size, I would say it's looking, leaning more towards a 13-line ground squirrel or secondary with maybe a vole. Definitely not a mole or pocket gopher, not a rat. Um, so I would lean towards, it's not perfectly round, so that's leaning more towards the vole. Okay. So I say a vole. All right, so a typical vole treatment. Vole treatment, uh, multi-catch traps, snap traps outside, uh, multi-catch traps, they're usually alive and you can translocate them with the vole out, out you know, short distance and they probably won't come back. Um, but, and there's also some toxicants on the market if you really, really want to use those for vole control. All right, thank you, Dennis. Uh, Lauren, we have had a plethora <laughs> of calls and, and emails about hibiscus, hardy hibiscus and not so hardy. You actually have two questions and they look very similar. One is from Bassett, Nebraska, and the other one is actually outside Lincoln, and they are these strange cupped foliage. So are we talking about disease here? Well, there's a couple things. Anytime I see a distorted growth or foliage like that, I, I start to think about growth regulator or herbicide drift injury because the newer tissues on those plants are going to be more sensitive and you're going to have that, that type of, of growth. Now, the other thing that can cause distorted growth, and with hibiscus, there are some viruses that, that can be in the plants that will do that as well. So if you have several plants in, in a planting or an area where you see that type of distorted growth or, or cupping of that newer tissue and you've got some older leaves that look nice, um, I really think that's going to be on the herbicide drift, you know, some sort of an injury that way. Uh, where it's cooler temperatures we're having right now, uh, we don't expect to see that as much, but there were some warm days here a couple weeks ago, and that would about time if anyone was making a herbicide application at all, there was a good chance for drift. Uh, if you have single plants and you see in that type of symptom and ones adjacent to them look healthy, then that's a virus and that's going to be time to rogue it out. All right. Thank you, Lauren. Kelly, you also have two different viewers with two different plants. The first is a Bella Anna hydrangea, 2011. Uh, they want to know how to make it stand up straighter and whether they should prune off the smaller flowers. And the second question is actually endless summer uh, planted in a rock flower bed competing with a maple and they wonder why it won't get big. Okay, well on the first question, um, that uh, Bella Anna, right? Bella right. Anna is, is, I've read where it is kind of known for uh, sometimes having stems that cannot support those blossoms. So there really isn't any nutrient that you can uh, fertilize it with that's going to strengthen those canes. You know, we've had a year where there's maybe been a little less sun or at least a lot of rain, and so sometimes that growth may be just a little bit more lush and succulent than other years if it's a bigger problem this year. Um, but mainly, the, about the only thing you really can do with that is to put in some staking material in the spring before it starts to grow that will provide some support to that plant. Um, on the endless summer, that was uh, the smaller one. It's just, I think it's the growing environment. Uh, hydrangeas uh, like morning sun, uh, but so about part shade, so morning sun and afternoon shade. So it's possible that they're just getting too much shade there. There's a little bit, they're pretty close to those trees. So the root competition 
Plus they're growing in, you know, a rock mulch, probably has a, you know, a weed mat underneath it and those just aren't ideal growing conditions. So I think the best thing to do with that one is to move it to a location that it will be happier in. All right, thank you, Kelly. All right, Michael, you get the next picture. Okay. This is a viewer who just got an acreage in Lincoln and they have apricots and they have peaches and they have in their apricots discovered nastiness and all sorts of worms and they're wondering what the worms are, what they can do about it to prevent it and whether it will then move to the peaches. So we have interesting stone fruit questions. Yes. Looking at it, the, there's probably about two insects that would cause some of the wounds we're seeing on the outside of the peaches like that or the apricots. Uh, one would be oriental fruit moth, uh, but I think our, our culprit in this particular situation is the plum curculio. And the plum curculio is kind of a, the adult. It's got chewing mouth parts at the end of a beak, and so that's how it makes those holes. Uh, they lay the eggs and then they, the larvae hatch, and then they go in and you're going to see them a lot of times in the middle of the fruit like we saw in the picture right there. Uh, control at this point in time is pretty difficult to do, but as the fruit fall off, uh, sanitation is always important. Uh, and then uh, be watchful next spring when things are out and about. All right, excellent. So this year they're gonna have protein with their apricots. <laughs> Unless, of course, they're already gone by the time the apricots are harvested. All right. Dennis, you have a possum question. Oh, okay. This viewer sent us a picture of this possum in a tree right on the corner of their house in the middle of day. So they're wondering why this guy was out in the middle of the day and what they can do to keep him from doing yeah. it again. <laughs> well, I mean, possums don't cause a lot of problem during the middle of the day, but some do come out in the day, especially this is like a young one. This is like, uh, looked like maybe last year's and came out. Um, most of the time they mind their own business. If you have horses, then you don't want opossums around because of their defecation can grow uh, a disease that hurts uh, horses, an equine disease. Um, other than that, they do dig, and so pretty much your only defense against opossums, if you want them gone, is a box trap or a live trap. And they are nomadic to some degree, and so they don't do as you know, they do okay with translocation and short distances. And since they're trapped at one place, that kind of hazes them not to come back to that same place. So you can move them less than 100 yards and they, there's a 50-50 chance they won't come back. Um, there are no toxins and there's no, you know, lethal control toxin-wise that can be legally used for opossum control. Um, they do dig and they do climb, so it's hard to exclude them. Um, but I would just stay back and watch them. They're, you know, they're a marsupial, and they're, I think, very interesting to watch. And the females have a pouch with, you know, the small little young in them right now. So enjoy them. <laughs> it's always possum interesting. Too. Yeah, yeah. that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That'd, That'd be my dog. December possum yeah. calendar picture. Oh, one other right thing, there. they're they're not noted um, of all the wild animals. They're the, probably the least. Not that it's impossible, but the least. Uh, capable of uh, getting rabies. Um, and so, you know, cats, dogs, uh, raccoons, skunks would get rabies a lot more prevalent than any marsupial, so. <laughs> All right, thank you, Dennis. All right, you have a question, Lauren, about English ivy. And it is all over the gazebo and all over the side of the house. Beautiful thing, but it's also covered with spots. Okay. And they're wondering, is this fungal and is propiconazole the right choice for there's a, couple, with it. there's a couple things. English ivy, there, there is actually a bacterial leaf spot and there's a fungal leaf spot on English ivy. So, you know, in that light, it's really difficult to say for sure that, that your propiconazole or fungus, any fungicide is going to work. So with that one, I think I would be, be really cautious and, and go ahead and, and submit something there to a diagnostic lab, you know, f to make sure what you're dealing with uh, because they can both look very similar. And English ivy is one that would give you that dark, circular spot a lot of times that will look similar fungal and bacterial. So on that situation, I would really encourage the viewer to, to try to get a diagnosis. You know, they could send it to the plant pest diagnostic clinic, for example, you know, or take it to their local extension office. They may be able to differentiate that. All right, thank you, Lauren. Um, Kelly, you have a viewer who wants to know about a, this fine textured grassy weed in the iris. Uh, grass be gone hasn't killed it. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, well, Graspagon has not killed it because this is one of the sedges 
And you know, it doesn't look like yellow nut sedge or purple nut sedge, which is kind of a common weed in lawns or even landscape beds. I don't know which sedge it is, um, but you know, sedges uh, in that Carex family are becoming very popular in the landscape. Uh, we're planting them more, we're seeing them in rain gardens, but they're also just planting them in the general landscape. Uh, they seem to tolerate dry areas as well as wet air, moist areas, moist soil areas. So, you know, it's not necessarily that bad looking. You could, you could keep it. Um, I guess if you don't like it, uh, we don't have the weed guy here, but maybe just some hand pulling. But I know the grass be gone will not kill it because it's a sedge and not a grass. So um, maybe you can in, learn to enjoy it. All right, Michael, you got a question. Uh, this is a viewer who found what they're describing as a little pupae, and they found it in the soil in a hole where last year's garden was. They describe it as being about an inch long and it's brown with a little, kind of a little hook on the end of it. Any idea what that might be? It may, I'm assuming from the description, it's gonna be the, the pupil stage of some type of a moth with the, with the hook probably gonna be the, the mouth parts. It sounds a little bit too small maybe to be uh, uh, the tomato hornworm moth, but it might be something similar to that. But it sounds like it's a, it's a moth pupa to me from All that right. description, but I can't tell from the species on that description. Okay, and nothing to do other than enjoy. It's, it's pretty soon it'll be an adult and it'll fly away. <laughs> okay, all right, Dennis, you have a question from Nebraska City. Okay. This is somebody who has moles and they're saying many, many moles, uh, tunnels all over, ru uh, ruining plants, digging around. What can they do about them? Okay. You may have less actual moles than you think. Uh, most moles, the female only stays within probably a third of an acre and a male goes up to three acres, but they travel a lot looking for earthworms, their main food source, and the males travel a lot looking for mates. So what you know, but normally would be you think is a lot of moles, one mole can easily go 50 to 80 foot per night in a 24 hour period uplifting the, uplifting the soil. For control, there's several methods. There's traps out there that you can use. We have an excellent guide on how to use the traps. There's also a toxicant in the way of a, it looks like a gummy worm. Um, the the uh, professional people have Talparid. If you wanted to do it yourself, um, there's Tomcat for moles. Uh, both these products have the exact same active ingredient. It's especially made for moles. Moles are attracted to it. Follow the directions exactly. Do not break up, even though they're expensive, the gummy worm, put half here, half there. The poison is mainly in one area of that, the citella, the fake citella of the worm that the mole will bite on first. So follow the directions exactly with any of these products and you should have excellent luck and control. All right, thank you, Dennis. This is a red bud question, Lauren. We've had two or three people this year that have asked us about modeling and strange appearances on the mm -hmm. foliage of red buds right about now. Again, is it herbicide or are there some viral things that attach well, or that attack red buds? Red, red buds are one of the most common ones for herbicide injury. So really with those, anytime you see those leaves cupped, uh, usually that's going to be uh, a herbicide injury. There, there's very few foliar diseases of red bud and, and viral infections for tree species is very uncommon. That way they may have them, but usually don't see symptoms. So uh, I'm, I'm going to go herbicide injury on that one too. Yeah, and hopefully we'll get to some fungal and bacterial causes here in a little bit, Kim. That'd be great. Oh, we like yours when we don't have very many or rots and spots. spots. <laughs> All right, Kelly, this is a viewer that has uh, sweet peas, probably the perennial sweet peas, and Gladys actually brought us a, a plant of the week sweet pea a while ago, but they're apparently taking over, so she wants to know how to get rid of the sweet peas, please. Oh, well. <laughs> If she wants to get rid of them completely, uh, it, it's going to be a little bit difficult. You just got to keep cutting them back and cutting them back to kind of keep them in bounds. Um, if you do keep them, if you want to get rid of them completely, just some digging, some hand pulling, but um, they're going to keep coming back for a while. So it's just one of those things, enjoy the blossoms, um, but keep cutting at them to keep them in bounds and let other things maybe take up the space and compete with them a little bit better. All right, thank you, Kelly. All right, you get the next question, Michael. Uh, this is actually kind of a moth question. This is a viewer who described uh, a moth with a six inch wingspan and 
sounded like eyes almost on the wings, like a white with a with a dark circle around it. Any notion on what one, what that one might be? Two things that come to mind, and I don't know what the color of the wings were. It was kind of a reddish purplish thing. Uh, as far as the base coloration of the leaves, I would go with the Cecropia moth. It's a big moth that would be flying this time of year. The other possibility was something related to that, but it usually flies a little bit later, more in July or August, and it's more of a tan-colored moth, but that would be a polyphemus moth. But they're both big moths with about a six-inch wingspan and some of the biggest moths we have in the area. Okay, so very cool. Yeah. All right, Dennis. Yes. Um, Endangered bats, is there such a thing as an endangered bat species in Nebraska? Yes, it, there, there are several, there's actually three species um, that are gonna become, be put on the endangered species list. And it's going to change the way we think about bats or at least the way anybody controls bats, whether they're professional or someone trying to do bat control in their own home. Because of these species being put on this list, a tier one list in the state, um, there's gonna, there's be some things such as you can't do any type of exclusion until the end of July, so you don't trap these endangered bats in a house where they could die, the young would fly at the end of July. So that'd probably be the biggest change, but we will see changes coming on the way we control all bats in the state, all of the 13 species, because of three species going on uh, the heightened list. All right, thank you, Dennis. This is an interesting one, Lauren. Uh, Blossom and rot, but it's a viewer who thinks they have it in their zucchini, the gray ones, the eight ball, and the golden eggs. And they're saying they flower, they set fruit, but then the ends become kind of rubbery and the fruits are bitter. And they're yeah. thinking maybe they have fertilized too much. Uh, and I, I don't think in that case it's related to fertilizer. Zucchini does get a what looks like blossom end rot many times that they actually will get a fungal infection it'll it'll have like a if you look let that proceed if there's enough moisture it'll almost get a gray fuzzy appearance which is the the fungal mold growing on it um, i'd love to hear from others on the panel too though of some of the reasons that sometimes those small fruit drop off that's not fungal because i think there's secondary things sometimes that will cause that and it's not always just botrytis or other fungi that come in there and do that. So the first thing would be to make sure you're, you're mulching them so they're not in contact with the soil. That's going to keep those fungal spores from coming up uh, and, and causing trouble that way. Uh, and then infecting the fruit and rotting it. But other things I, I'm not aware of, you know, but there, there could be other things that would do that too. All right. So. so we'll see if we get that question again later in the season. Yeah, that would be great. All right, Kelly, uh, this is a viewer who has an ash. Sounds like an autumn purple ash has a lot of branches in it that appear to be dead. They're concerned about um, you know, whether it can survive that and should they go ahead and, and prune those branches out. Okay, well on the pruning, I mean if the branch is actually dead, go ahead and prune it. Um, that, that's an important thing to do on any tree species. Um, you might want to check the trunk of that tree and look for some signs of some bore holes possibly. I don't know, Michael, if you want to add to that, but sometimes if a tree, especially an ash tree, a couple years ago we had severe drought and uh, when in those drought years they're stressed and that's usually when our native borers, uh, um, a lot like ash borer, the uh, banded ash borer and so on will get into those trees. So usually two, three years later we start seeing uh, dieback of branches. So I checked the trunk area for signs of some holes, some emergence holes. Um, if you can find those, you might want to consider an application. It'd probably be next spring or next year for boars, or this year's yet too. All right, thank you, Kelly. And we're gonna go ahead and look at the plants of the week, which are actually seed heads that okay. remind us a little bit of the 4th of July. That's right, and these are from Kim's garden, aren't they? They are. Yeah, Kim brought these tonight, <laughs> and, and it does show the, the beauty of seed heads. So it's not just the flowers that are pretty, but the seed heads as well. And she's put together a fireworks or firecracker display, this large ball that uh, tomorrow night they'll be bursting in the sky and well, and then on the 4th of July too. In Columbus, they're on July 3rd. That's why I said tomorrow night. But this is a, a allium, one of the large alliums that bloom, oh, in May typically. Sometimes they bloom later. There's so many alliums, but this is the large one. And then we've got um, the solitary clematis and I keep wanting to say devil. <laughs> dark towers. Dark towers. I've got devil in my brain for dark towers, but this is a dark 
uh, Towers uh, Panstamon, and it's another one that kind of has the reddish foliage and red leaves, and it's actually considered better than the Husker Red because that foliage will retain its red leaves a little bit better. But that's just a nice combination there of seed heads of flowers, the Allium, the Dark Towers Panstamon, and the Solitary Clematis. So thanks, Kim, for All bringing right. that in. Thank you, Kelly. Have to get in the spirit of that 4th of July. All right, Michael, you have a question from a viewer who has, uh, they have bur oaks that are beginning to, to drop their foliage a little bit, and one of them has kind of, they're, they're looking at the little, you can see the little red, like gall-like okay. thing in there. And they're wondering if those are related and what they should do about it, and is it in fact an insect gall? It does indeed look like a wasp gall, and inside that, if you cut that open, you'd find a developing wasp. but that's going to be specific to that area of the leaf. It should not be causing the leaves to turn brown and fall off. Uh, one possibility may be there might be some lace bugs or something like that that might be starting at this point in time in the year. But um, the gall that we're seeing is not related to the leaves drying and falling off. Okay, and, and again, we're having some issues with that. Dennis, I don't think it's critter yet, so who knows. Your next question, however, though, is a critter. Okay. This would be um, turtles eating the pond plants. So mm -hmm. if you want the turtle, you want the pond plants, how do you keep one from <laughs> eating the other? <laughs> well, for one, this is a picture of a red ear slider, which is only native to the extreme southeast corner of Nebraska, but it's very common in the pet trade. And we see red ear sliders at Holmes Lake and Lincoln and all the lakes in, in Omaha and across the state. And, Grand Island. The radar slider is more opportunistic at being a herbivore or more an omnivore and eating more herbaceous plants. If you go with our native painted turtles, they're more likely to eat worms and some of the insects and small minnows and also the tails of those golden carp that come from all over the place but here. And so if you make if you change the species to our native painted turtle, you'll have less chance of them eating your plants. <laughs> and so otherwise, uh, keeping the red ear slider and the plants, you're always going to have some, you know, some uh, herbation taking place. If you feed them more worms, because they are omnivorous as well, the red ear slider, they may eat less plant material if they're happy with a lot of worms. So feed them more worms and see how that goes. <laughs> All right, thank you. You have a question, Lauren, uh, about a viewer who has, for the first time, been growing Asian beans. And they're seeing all of this interesting sort of yellow modeling in the foliage. Mm -hmm. And they don't have any experience with this particular plant. They're wondering, are there viruses of beans that would be an uh, issue? Uh, there, there's quite a few viruses on beans. And, and I'm not for sure looking at that. When they say Asian beans, if they're the edamame soybean, for example, not a different kind. Um, so there, there are some that would be common though. One particular, if you had bean leaf beetles feeding on them, uh, there's a virus that's bean pod model virus that affects many different species of, of bean. So that would be one that would cause that modeling um, and, and could be the problem. The best thing to do would be if, if, if it is that you've had bean leaf beetles feeding is to make sure you're doing some good insect control. That'll keep it from spreading. Uh, once it's in the plant, you can't do anything about it. But uh, you know, if you're looking at maybe growing another cycle of those yet this year, you could do that and just make sure you have good good insect control. All right, thank you, Lauren. Kelly, your question is from a viewer in Omaha, and they have a sour cherry tree. They've heard that apples should be thinned a, a bit uh, to to promote fruiting and especially for air circulation. You can see all the foliage on the screen on this one. So they're wondering about doing some cleaning out, but they also understand that the small branches are the fruiting spurs. <laughs> right, right. Um, basically on the sour cherry, they, they fruit on what, uh, what we call a fruiting spur, like Kim just said. And usually they're fairly young spurs, they're about two to five years old. But sour cherry will also uh, bear fruit kind of on the ends of the terminal branches. So really with pruning, once you have your, your, your basic structure and form, um, probably about, you don't do a lot of extensive pruning after that, but you do want to do some thinning out on just about any fruit tree. You want to do some thinning out to let air circulation through, 
uh, if you're doing a spray program that helps you to get better spray coverage of the plant and the fruit, but it also lets sunlight in uh, and it can increase, increase production a little bit more towards, not the center of the tree, but throughout the tree rather than just on the ends of those branches. And because it does bear fruit on the younger fruiting spurs, two years, five years old, um, some pruning, you don't want to overdo it, you don't want to do a lot of pruning, but it looked to me, it was pretty dense, pretty thick, so I would go in there and prune out some of those branches that are growing towards the center, uh, maybe crisscrossing, rubbing against each other, just do a little bit of thinning. Each, um, each year, either when it's dormant or you could do it this time of the year yet as well. All right, Michael, you get a, uh, a question about a strange hopper. And this is a groundskeeper who uh, said that they were actually out and about and they found this guy uh, a cavity. So there was a little cavity in the ground and found it. Exterior looks like a cockroach, and but like a grasshopper and it didn't fly, but it, it moved pretty quickly. What is that? Well, it is actually related to a grasshopper. And actually what this picture is showing us is this is a species of cave cricket. We don't see cave, cave crickets very often, but this is, an, this, is an, this is a cave cricket. They're very also, uh, also closely related to camel crickets, which have you know, much more humped back. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's a nice picture of a, of a cave cricket. A cave cricket. Yes. All right, there's a bug anywhere, everywhere, isn't there? Almost. <laughs> okay, speaking of things everywhere, Dennis, your next yes. pictures. We have a viewer who sent in a picture of a squirrel harvesting their spruce branches, much yep. to their chagrin. And then we also had a picture of, uh, I believe this is a honey locust, and, and all of this sort of chipping, chomping okay. sort of behavior. Well, we have two things going on. Uh, one is a feeding behavior, and you know, squirrels and trees evolved and been around together for eons, and they're not, if they, you know, unless it's a small tree that's just starting out, the squirrel's probably not gonna do too much damage, but if you think they are causing some problems in the look of the tree, pretty much you're gonna have to, you know, live trap or box trap that particular squirrel and remove it if the, if the feeding behavior is going on. For, as far as the chipping, what's happening, that's squirrel graffiti. What's ha the male squirrel is going around, he's chipping and he's rubbing a gland in his chin on the base of the tree, telling the other male squirrels in the area, my territory, you go somewhere else. Um, and that can be stopped by using a repellent product that you can buy at any you know, garden center. Or if you want to mix you know, vegetable oil and jalapeno pepper juice or cayenne pepper, the first time it goes there and chews again, it's not going to hurt the squirrel, but it's going to give it a bad sensation, and there's a chance the squirrel will leave that. People always ask, how much cayenne pepper do I put with the vegetable oil, or how much habanero sauce I put with the vegetable oil? Just taste it. If it makes you run for water, you got it hot enough. <laughs> That's the way to do it. There, there's a, a thought and a visual for our audience. Yeah. <laughs> it might be worth watching and see where that squirrel <laughs> runs to. Yeah. I like that. Okay, uh, Lauren, we have a viewer who has hostas that are about two to three years old. Um, they're seeing these strange sort of wilted foliage things and they, they think it is spreading from hosta to hosta. So do we have diseases of hosta? Yeah, so they're, they're, this is one where we're most likely looking at a virus in this. So the, the best treatment on that's gonna be, you know, I always say rogue it out, but that's, on this one, you're really gonna wanna get rid of it and make sure it's not spreading. Now, it's not gonna be in the soil, uh, but you're gonna wanna take that plant material and probably the best thing is to just, just get that out of your landscape, you know, and, and put it in your yard waste container or something like that. You could bury it. Um, if you have a compostable area or some, a compost area, you could, you know, bury that so that you wouldn't have movement because many times with these there'll be thrips or something on there that may move it from plant to plant. So just watch really careful. Um, many of those are quite difficult to manage the thrips that, and things that will move some of these. Uh, but just rogue that out of the landscape and, and watch for spread. All right. Thank you, Lauren. Mm -hmm. Kelly, we have a viewer that has uh, a backyard maple and, and actually they have some questions that they wonder about whether they need a remedy, starting with the base of the trunk. And then they also had a question about covering that with soil and then th what they think is a deformity up uh, in, the, in the branches, which I believe our audience can see also on the screen. Right. Okay, well, luckily, neither one of these are a deformity, um, but the old 
I guess the area at the base of the trunk, most likely this is probably a grafted maple. Uh, they don't say which one, but maybe Autumn Blaze is a very popular one, and that's a graft between a silver maple and a red maple. But, but anyway, that appears to be uh, the grafted area, which sometimes just looks a little bit different. I would do not cover it up. Um, sometimes you can get graft incompatibility, but it doesn't appear to be happening there. It'll swell up or it'll look really, really odd. But this looks pretty normal to me for a graft at the base. So just let it be. It looks like it's planted at the right depth. Um, do not cover it with soil. Um, just, just let it go. And the branch part is what we call branch bark ridge, and that's normal. Uh, it actually tells you, shows you where to prune. Whenever you're pruning, we always say to prune outside that branch bark ridge. Make sure you leave that on the tree because it's part of the trunk. So, and that one, sometimes you can get ingrown bark, but I don't, if you have too narrow um, of a crotch between a branch and the trunk, uh, but that looks pretty normal to me. So uh, enjoy it, it's looking very, looking fine to me. This is a, uh, let's see, I don't, we don't know where this person is, but what we do have is a bumblebee nest. They're saying bumblebees. Black and yellow, and they could hear an underground hive. So they were told they could clear away the debris, look for the hole, use some eight to get rid of them. What would we recommend for that? Well, it seems like we have a lot of pollinators that are at risk, and so I really hesitate to tell people to kill bees. I just don't think it's a good thing. Right now, there's a nest in there, and it makes sense that bumblebees do nest in the ground. So it's very, very probably uh, bumblebees. Uh, obviously, if, if they remove the yucca, uh, you know, there is going to disturb them. They may come out, they may get stung. So if they need to, probably the best thing is put on some protective care. And once the, once the yucca is out of the way, the bees will still be there. Um, but spraying it is not going to do a good job because the, everything is under the ground and the insecticide will not go down there to where it needs to be. Can they cover up the hole or do anything like that? They could, but again, they could, but I don't, I don't recommend killing bees. It's just, <laughs> not, as an entomologist, we would like to have some pollinators out there so we have plants. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Dennis, this is a carny viewer who says they keep finding snakes with both the heads and the tails chopped off. And, they're wonder and the person is wondering whether they should be afraid. <laughs> yes, um, that's caused by one of the most dangerous animals we have in the state, uh, an ignorant person. Um, because if both the head and tail is gone, it's a person, it's not an animal. If it's just the head was gone or part of the body was chewed, I'd say a skunk or something else, a scavenger. But I've seen this across the state many times. People have this notion if they see a runover snake, especially if they think it's a rattlesnake, even though it might not be, they cut the head and tail off and keep them as souvenirs. Um, and if both just the head and tail are cut off and it's on the side of a road, it's almost sure to be a person that did it. All right, thank so you. So be Dennis. very afraid. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dennis. All right, uh, Lauren, we have a couple of viewers who are concerned about seeing black margins on kind of the nodes of some of their oak leaves. Is that disease potentially? Uh, most likely there is anthracnose that we'll see on oaks as well uh, as many other tree species. And there's not really at this time of year, I wouldn't really recommend any kind of management, but next spring if you're looking at a situation where it, it actually can, on younger trees, uh, form some uh, areas where you get some twig dieback even due to that and and with that case you may want to treat those early in the season right when those leaves are starting to emerge when the buds are opening up um, that's where you look at, at making a, a fungicide application to try to do that next year uh, most of the time it's not going to harm the tree enough that it warrants a chemical but if you're trying to establish a young tree sometimes you can get some dieback that that can be a, it can be beneficial to treat it all right thank you Lauren Kelly, we have a viewer who has uh, said they see multitudes of daylilies in full bloom, and we have some behind us at the zoo. They have some plants, however, that are about six years old. They're on the east side of the house. They put on a lot of foliage, but not much flower. Any idea? Okay. Okay. Well, if they're six years old and they have never bloomed, um, I guess I would give up on them. <laughs> so, you know, maybe hard to say sometimes why they don't bloom. I, I, maybe getting planted too deep, although you don't hear that very often with, uh, with daylilies. 
Um, sometimes if there's too much shade, too much competition from nearby trees or shrubs, if, that, if none of those things fit, um, and they haven't bloomed for six years, then I would give up on them. I, I don't know what else to do. Try, there's so many good daylilies out there. Just try something new. Plant it in the ideal growing condition, uh, which daylilies are pretty tough. They tolerate part shade to full sun. Just make sure they're not planted too deep, and make sure you're not over fertilizing with nitrogen. All right, and use Gladys's rule of three strikes and you're out. Right. <laughs> in six years, this case. Yeah. Okay, uh, Michael, we have, uh, we had this question last week too, but apparently it is still going on, and that is viewers are seeing what they're describing as white soap flakes flying all over the landscape and then landing on things, and then it appears as though it's, there is some sort of insect that is involved with the soap flake. What is it, and is it specific to the host, or is it, will it eat anything? That's a good question. <laughs> are they the adelgid? It's very possible yeah. that it could be. Um, there are lots of other things that are flying around as well right now. Uh, we've seen a lot of cotton lint flying around as well. It could be an adelgid. It's really hard to say without seeing it exactly what it is, but yeah. th that's a good possibility. Okay, and are, are they uh, host specific or do they pretty much land on anything? Well, when they're flying, they land on most everything, but they're not gonna colonize every plant. Just certain plants will be colonized by them. Okay, all right, thank you, Michael. Dennis, we've never had this question before. This is a Fall City viewer who wonders uh, how to get rid of bog lemmings. Well, we don't have any in Nebraska. I don't think there ever, ever been any bog lemmings in Nebraska. That's probably why we have never had the question before. <laughs> they may be thinking of pine voles, which are one of the three vole species that look like a larger mouse with a very short tail and you can't see their ears. And I think some people may mistaken a vole, especially a pine vole, which a pine vole is one of our species in need of conservation um, in, in this southeast corner where Fall City is located in Richardson County. Um, that one is protected. Otherwise, if it's in the landscape and causing holes and chewing on bulbs, it's just a meadow vole or a prairie vole, and you would control it as you would any other vole with a, uh, a multi-trap, uh, spring trap, um, one of those trap devices with a little, you know, maybe some uh, molasses with seed or oats rolled in as a bait, and they, they're usually fairly easy to catch. All right, thank you, Dennis. Lauren, we have about 30 seconds. We have viewers that have wilt in their potato plants, and they're using a 50-50 sand soil mix for drainage. Okay, um, it's well drained uh, with a wilt like that. I'm, I'm gonna guess we're dealing with a fusarium or verticillium wilt, possibly. Um, I'd really just encourage them with that 30 second answer, send that to the diagnostic lab for an identification so you know for sure what you're doing and for managing that in the future because you're going to want to look at resistance according to what it is.